Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Rina Agarwal, Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Welcome to the Georgetown Global Virtual FinTech Seminar Series. Uh, today, we have a special event that's focused on data privacy and finance. I hope everyone is hanging in there, doing all right. Uh, th these are interesting times. Uh, the global society is facing really complex challenges in, in a number of areas. Certainly, healthcare, and that's one area, health, but also more broadly on socioeconomic inequity issues. And uh, I do believe that we as finance scholars, we have an obligation to study these issues and be part of the solution. This is where the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy comes in. We provide thought leadership for global finance. And we really believe in excellence and research to impact practice and policy. We want to be part of the group that's providing solutions to the challenges that the global society is face, facing. And I, I think today's a, uh, event, the papers that are going to be presented are a good example, a really good example of uh, how we as finance scholars can play our role and take up our responsibility of addressing some of these issues. The recordings of our events, they're available on our website. I invite you to learn more about the center and uh, you can go to our website or follow our Twitter handle. I'm really grateful to our team, Alberto Rossi, who has organized the seminar series. And uh, Alberto is the, the Associate Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. And Anna Cormus, Anna is the Assistant Director of the center. We are very grateful to our partners and our sponsors, including Ripple, we are part of Ripple's University Blockchain Research Initiative that brings seminars together. So today we have three terrific papers on privacy. The first paper will be presented by Huan Tang of LSC, and then we'll have uh, two additional papers. Uh, Alberto will manage the question and answers. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Han Tang for the first presentation. And uh, please do keep yourself muted while uh, the talk is going on. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Rina, for the great introduction. And many thanks to you and Alberto for including me in this exciting event. Okay, I hope everybody see the full screen now, right? Good. So this is a paper about the value of privacy, which has become uh, increasingly important for the fintech industry. This industry has been rapidly growing in the past decade. The year of 2019 oversee over 5 trillion transaction volume in major fintech sectors, including digital payments, personal finance, and alternative lending. A key innovative aspect of the fintech's uh, business model is really the use of customer data to either improve capital allocation efficiency or to directly generate revenue. Here are two examples. A fintech unicorn, Cabbage, which is an online small business lending platform, uses borrowers' social media patterns to help make loan decisions. Another fintech unicorn, Credit Karma, offers free credit reports on a weekly basis to millions of people while collecting revenue from targeted advertising by financial companies on the platform. In most cases, data is crucial for the business growth. However, data is not really free. Although there's no explicit price on the data, individuals may be reluctant to share private data. Therefore, the uh, growth of this uh, business model is constrained by how much people are willing to share their data and how much data can be collected from customers. In order to, un this constraint, uh, uh, in order to understand these constraints, we need to know the value of privacy. But the answer to this question is not obvious. I'm sure many of you have heard of the so-called privacy paradox, which is people often say they care about privacy, but in reality, we still observe them keep relinquishing personal data to online platforms such as Facebook and Google. In addition, evidence based on lab experiments or survey data often reveals very small to zero value of privacy. Motivated by those debates and observations, 
This paper investigates a very simple question. Do people value privacy? If they do, how much? Can we put a dollar amount on that? And what are the implications for fintech firms? To answer this question, one faces an empirical challenge, which is it is quite difficult to measure the demand for privacy or individuals' willingness to pay for privacy. I address this empirical challenge using a real-life setting, which is online lending in China. This is a particularly suitable setup to study privacy because online borrowers in China face a clear trade-off between privacy and credit access. Let me explain. There are two features about this market you need to know. First of all, there's no official credit bureau that offers a credit score with large coverage. As a result, online lenders have to collect extensive amount of information from borrowers in order to price their credit, uh, their, uh, credit risk. And second, only 25% of the population are served by banks. So that leads P2P lending to be a, pop, a particularly popular borrowing option in China. As a result, uh, in 2018, the overall loan amount outstanding reached over 220, uh, 220 billion dollars, which represents over 50 percent of the global online lending market. So the online lending market in China itself is an important setup for us to understand the value of privacy. In this context, I also exploit two uh, data from two large scale field experiments in which a major online lending platform randomly vary the amount of information collected from borrowers and loan terms. In addition, I developed a structure model to quantify the value of privacy and the cost of data collection on borrowers and on platforms. Here's a preview of my key findings. The headline result is that applicants value social network ID and employer contact at $33 which represents over half of the average daily salary in China. In addition, this accounts for 8% of the value of a foregone loan for successful borrowers. Therefore, it is a non-trivial amount. Second, I show that individuals' reluctance to share information to the platform is not driven by them having an incentive to hide negative information about their credit worthiness. It's not driven by them getting exhausted with additional disclosure requirements and I show evidence consistent with the intrinsic preference for privacy. Last, the result from the structure model is about the cost of data collection. I show that requiring borrowers to disclose these two additional data items, social network ID and employer contact, decreases borrower welfare by 13% because they care about privacy. But at the same time, it also reduces platform profit by 10% which is largely driven by a lower loan demand associated with higher disclosure requirement. Now, let me introduce the experimental setup by walking you through applicants' decision-making process. When applicants arrive on the platform, they first need to decide whether to disclose the information required in the application questionnaire or not. If they decide to disclose, they move to a second stage in which they observe loan terms set by the platform and decide whether to take up the loan or not. For those who decide to take up the loan, I observe the full payment history. I have data from two experiments. The first one offers randomization in the set of questions included in the application survey. Those questions include social network ID, employer contact, and marital status. And I will be more specific about those questions in a minute. The second experiment offers randomization in loan terms, in particular loan size and fees. These two experiments allow me to gauge the marginal effects of disclosure requirement and loan terms on loan demand. And by contrasting the two marginal effects, I'm able to back out the monetary value of privacy. So an uh, average loan on the website for the background information, it's about $540. It's amortizing over 12 months Average interest rate 11%, average fee 29%, and average delinquency rate is 15%. Now, let's start with the first experiment. The participants in the first experiment are first-time applicants who have never shared any information with the platform before. Upon their arrival on the platform, they are randomly sorted into five groups, one control group, and four treatment groups. Borrowers in the four treatment groups are required to answer fewer questions, which are listed as follows. 
the first one, social network ID, or QQID. QQ is one of the most popular social network software in China. In terms of function, it's a combination of WhatsApp and email service provider. The second question is marital status. Third question is employer contact. In particular, the landline telephone number of the applicant's employer. And in the last treatment groups, all these previous three questions are deleted completely from the application survey. And I label those groups as the no QQ, no marriage, no landline, and delete all group. Here, what you see on the screen is what the applicants see exactly during the application process. There are two pages in the application survey. On page one, the questions are mostly about their basic information, including mobile, name, national ID, QQ and marital status appears at the bottom half of the page. In the middle, you have education level. On the second page, the questions are more work-related. Employer contact appears here. Before moving to the main treatment effects, I want to show you that the randomization is done properly. Here, I'm plotting the distribution of gender, age, education level, and mobile device types by the five treatment arms with each bar representing one treatment arm. As you can see, a course of five groups and a course various variables, uh, there's no discernible difference. Therefore, the randomization was successful. Now let's take a look at the main treatment effect of disclosure requirements on loan demand. What I observe is whether each applicant decides to uh, complete the questionnaire or not. The baseline completion rate of the control group in which all these three questions are included is 30.8 percentage point. Removing the QQ question increases that rate by one percentage point. Removing the marital status question, no significant impact. Removing landline, positive impact. And last, once all three questions are removed together, the completion rate jumps by 1.3 percentage point. So these results tell us that applicants do care about two of these three questions that is social network ID and employer contact. But of course, there are different reasons for why an individual is concerned about sharing data with a, a lending platform. I show in the paper that this is not driven by risky applicants having an incentive to hide negative information. It is not driven by them getting tired. And I'm going to show you one table for each of these alternative hypotheses. So the key prediction from the adverse selection uh, hypothesis is that only safe borrowers will choose to disclose. Therefore, conditional on applicants completing the questionnaire, those in the groups with higher disclosure requirement will be safer than the, uh, those in the group with uh, lower disclosure requirement. In order to test this prediction, I compare the risk measures across the five groups and these risk measures includes the internal grade given by the platform, whether the application is pre-approved, loan size and fees both determined by the platform, and the fraction of eventual payments made by the borrowers. As you can see, across all measures and across all five groups, there's no discernible difference, which is inconsistent with the prediction of the first alternative hypothesis. The second key alternative hypothesis is that maybe people just get tired, therefore they drop out when you ask for more information. In order to rule out this hypothesis, I take advantage of the fact that there are two pages in the application survey and the QQ question appears on page one. If we compare the no QQ group to the control group, after them completing the questionnaire, you would expect those in the group with the QQ question to be more exhausted on page two. Therefore, they are less likely to complete page two. So here I'm showing you the conditional completion rate of page two, and it is inconsistent with prediction of this alternative uh, hypothesis. Therefore, uh, uh, I conclude this is not the main channel driven the result. I also would like to present to you some evidence that's consistent with applicants having a preference for privacy. The preference is of course not directly observable, but it's often related to demographics. In particular, I find that the treatment effects are stronger for female and old applicants, and there's no heterogeneity across income and education. These results are highly consistent with what has been documented in the literature about privacy concerns 
for example, this Gold Farb and Tucker 2012 AR paper also find similar results. And this 2020 uh, working paper by Prince and Watson find uh, the same result across countries and across data items. So because of this uh, consistency, uh, the results I find is unlikely to be driven by other channels. Now, let me move to the second part of the experiment. We know that people do value some data items. The next step is to put a price on them. This is where the second RCT comes in. This experiment offers randomization in loan size and fees. In particular, borrowers in the control group receive regular loans. Borrowers in the first treatment groups receive loans twice as large. And borrowers in the second treatment groups also receive uh, additional fee reduction for average of $130. The take-up rates by groups are shown on the right of the screen. By comparing these numbers, it is clear that borrowers prefer larger loans and cheaper loans, which is not surprising. What's more interesting is the magnitude of this treatment effect and how it compares to the magnitude of that in the first experiment. Now we can finally combine the two experiments by taking the ratio of the two treatment effects and multiplying it by the size of the fee reduction. The resulting $30 is a back of the envelope calculation for the monetary value of QQ and then line. What this $30 represents is the fee reduction that would exactly offset the drop in loan demand caused by the two additional data questions. Of course, this calculation is subject to a few assumptions and caveats. For example, these two marginal effects are obtained using two different samples. One is obtained using everybody arriving on the platform. The other is obtained using those who have completed the questionnaire. And those two groups of people may, be, may not be exactly the same. Therefore, in order to obtain a more precise measure of uh, the value of privacy, I develop a structure model. Additional benefit of the structure model is that it also allows me to quantify the impact of various data collection policies on borrower welfare and platform profit. So because of time constraint, I'm going to skip the details of the model but provide the big picture here. This is a model about applicants' discrete choices. Each applicant has up to three choices to make, disclose or not, take up or not, and repay or not. I link each of these three discrete choices to a set of borrower characteristics, to disclosure requirements, and to loan terms. With some efforts, I end up with four final estimating equations. I have four equations instead of three because I separately analyze page one and page two decisions since the three questions are spread over the two pages. How should we read these four equations? Let's just take the first one, for example. This first equation tells us how is the page one disclosure decision determined. It depends on who the borrower is, X prime. It depends on whether the QQ question is included, whether the marital status question is included. And crucially, it also depends on their expectation on L, loan size, and R, repayment size. So similarly, page two disclosure decision depends on whether the landline question is included, Take up decision depends on the actual loan terms. And finally, the repayment decision depends on the expected repayment schedule. If we were to estimate those four equations independently of each other, we would have uh, four very standard profit or logic models. However, here's an additional twist. I allow the four unobservables to be freely correlated so as to capture the adverse selection. Just to give you an idea, let's say if the take-up unobservable is positively correlated with the default unobservable, we have the standard adverse selection problem. Because those who are more likely to take up, up the loan due to unobservable factors are also more likely to default. And similar interpretation applies to other pairwise uh, correlation between the unobservables. Now, the last information I want to comment on is how should we calculate the uh, monetary value of privacy just from these four equations. Take QQ, for example. It's very, very simple. We need to take the coefficient for QQ, divide it by the coefficient for loan size. So theta over gamma would be the value of QQ. What this value represents is the money you need to give 
to the applicant today in the form of loan principle to make them equally happy if you include additional QQ question. Now, let's take a look at the main estimation result. This table shows the marginal impact of the questions and loan terms on page one and page two disclosure probabilities. It has become very straightforward to calculate the value of QQ and land line. So let's take the ratio of the two relevant coefficients. This gives us $21. That's the value of QQ. And similarly, I can calculate the value of land line, which is $12. The combined $33 is more than half of the average daily salary in China. Next, because I also have separate variation in loan size, and repayment, which occurs in the future, I can estimate individual sensitivity to current and future uh, cash flow respectively, which allows me to uh, get estimate for their discount factor. With that, I can calculate the average present value of a loan for each borrowers, which is $420. If we compare the value of QQ and land line to that piece of value, we find that uh, the value of QQ and land line accounts for 8% of the value of a foregone loan. So it is a significant fraction. With all these elements together, I'm able to calculate the average welfare in each of the treatment arms for both successful borrowers and for all applicants. Let's start from the left panel, which shows the welfare for borrowers. If we move borrowers from the control group to the delete all group group, we exclude the three questions, their welfare increases by 7%. This is because they care about privacy. When we look at all applicants and move them from the control group to the delete all group, the welfare gain becomes larger. It is 13%. So the additional 6% comes from the fact that, comes from the extensive margin, in fact, and in the sense that some applicants who would have been uh, who would have dropped out now are willing to proceed because you remove the three additional questions. Therefore, there is both a positive impact at the extensive and intensive margin. Now, let me spend the last three minutes talking about the implications for platform. As mentioned in the motivation part, why does privacy matter for, uh, for platform? It is because data is not a really uh, a free input. When the platform collects more data, their profit may get hurt because customers have a lower demand for their financial products. In order to assess the impact of additional data collection on platform profit, I follow a simple three-step procedure. In the first step, I predict demand and repayment probability for each of the applicant arriving on the platform using the demand estimation we have seen. And second, I use this element to calculate the revenue from uh, underwriting each loan to the applicant. So the only missing piece in the calculation of profit is the cost of lending for the platform. And I estimate the cost of lending under the assumption that the observed loan terms, loan size and rate maximize platform profit. And I find that for each dollar originated, the cost of lending is 11 cents. Now I'm well equipped to calculate the platform profit under different data collection policies. Here I'm presenting a counterfactual case for the delete all group in which we put back the three questions. If we do not include the three questions, on average, the platform collects $4.9 from each applicant arriving on the platform. Once you include the three additional questions, that amount drops by 50%, which represents a 10% drop in the platform profit. This is the cost of collecting additional data items. And I would like to wrap up now by making a few uh, comments. In this paper, not only I show that individuals do attach a positive value to privacy, I also show with the structure model that data collection could cause a debt we loss if the data is sensitive for consumers, but has little economic benefit in predicting relevant outcomes such as loan default. So an optimal data collection policy would require firms or regulators to identify such data items. And this paper offers a generalizable methodology for firms or regulators to perform such exercise. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Juan, for a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, we have a couple, number of questions uh, um, that came through chat, so let me try to organize them. I think we have like three main themes. The first one was uh, generalizability of the results. Um, so Vikas Agarwal, Agarwal is uh, asking, how general, generalizable is the value of privacy for the borrowers on this platform as interest rates and delinquency rates are so high? And mm -hmm. uh, Rina is also asking, do you think the results will be similar for different products such as unsecured loans, uh, secured loans or mortgages and credit cards? And I think also related to this, uh, Mark Capsi uh, was asking, um, is uh, the 29% really, the origination fee is really that high? So this is kind of the first set of questions, if you can mm -hmm. address them. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think uh, those are all related questions about the external validity of my result mm -hmm. here. Um, maybe first of all, I can start by uh, showing you a, a, a graph, which is uh, privacy concerns across countries. Of course, many people would think China is a particularly uh, context where people may place a little or uh, more value on privacy. But in fact, if you look at the share of population who say they are concerned about their online privacy or the share of those who distrust internet because they distrust online banking, China is not so different from any other countries. On the left panel, China is between Germany and France. On the right panel, China is between Japan or Germany. So, of course, I agree this is not the perfect answer to this question. And in order to know the ultimate answer, whether we can compare this value across countries, we would need to see more follow-on studies on this using data from other countries. So the other aspect of the external validity comes from uh, whether this value applies to other financial products and uh, uh, whether this high cost uh, product is some, uh, has some special features. So I would like to mention that uh, uh, only 25% of the Chinese population have access to credit cards, which makes uh, online lending particularly popular in China. So these boards on the webs, uh, on, the, on the platform are really not a special uh, group of the consumers in China. If you, if you would like, they could represent the rest 80% that have no access to bank credit cards. So in that sense, uh, I don't think uh, it's, it's a very special group and uh, we, we should discard them. Uh, and whether the 29% uh, origination fee is high, I, I can only say that in, peer, in the peer-to-peer -peer lending market, it is the norm. So uh, the overall cost of borrowing, including interest rate and uh, fees are about 36% annualized and uh, this is true across all platforms and it, it is comparable to the credit card uh, in, Amer uh, in America. I think the usually the credit card, the cost, the interest rate on the credit card is between 24% to, to 36%. So okay, I... So the, oh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. Please, please. Yeah, no, the, the second set of um, uh, questions are related to the QQID. The first question comes from Christian Wagner, who's asking, what information can the lending institution derive from the QQID? So it seems to me a rather risky way of evaluating the borrower. And then Pat Fisher also kind of follows up on the same question. And he says, well, do QQID and employer contact provide a method of finding individuals who eventually default? So if so, then the privacy effect may be more than just wanting to avoid future contact if this data is sold. Yes, thanks for this set of excellent questions. I should have uh, provided more background on the, uh, on the QQID. So with the QQID, you can basically do two things. First, send a friend request uh, to the customers and second, send an email. So you can view it as a, uh, as a, as a piece of email address. And the original purpose uh, of collecting this information is actually for anti-fraud. So this is how it works. If, say, two individuals, they don't want to put in their true QQID there and instead put some random numbers from one to nine, then the platform will easily identify those kind of fraud account by course comparing the QQID in the database. So in that sense, yes, uh, there's also, a, I would also like to uh, mention the distinction between the actual use of the data and the perceived use of the data. It is true that the platform is indeed using this uh, information for risk control, but that's not exactly how the boards would expect. Otherwise, we would uh, see a adverse selection effect on the type of borrowers who are willing to disclose, which is only safe borrowers, and that will show up in the eventual uh, loan performance, which I don't observe. 
Perfect. So I have uh, another question from, uh, this is more on the heterogeneity. Uh, Vikas Agarwal is asking, is saying, it is surprising to see that older borrowers value privacy more as they should have lower costs associated with compromising their privacy based on the horizon. So, um, yeah, here's also something I should have uh, clarified from the beginning. By old, I mean individuals about 30%. Because 30 is the median age in the sample, so we're not really talking about 60-year-old individual. It's above and uh, below 30, per, uh, 30 years old. Yeah. And um, also, let me just ask you one other question. Then there are a couple of more comments, but you can go through the chat yourself uh, at the end and maybe respond individually. So this is uh, always uh, from uh, Vikas, who's saying there is a use the path platform and how many of them default so more disclosure can reduce default and actually increase the profits for the lender so can you say anything about what is the optimal disclosure from the platform perspective yes so in the paper i actually by looking at the eventual loan performance i find that when you demand more information that does not lead to a lower default probability which means it is actually not used by the platform for uh, reinforcing that collection I see, I see, I see. Okay, perfect. I think uh, we can uh, uh, move on to the second paper. Thank you, Juan, for the excellent presentation. And the second paper is titled The Market for Data Privacy, and it's um, co-authored by Tarun Ramadoraid, Antoine Utwaler, and uh, Ansgar Walter, and Ansgar is going to be presenting the paper. Ansgar, you can take it away. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and present this paper. Uh, yeah, it's a joint work with my colleague Tarun and our student Antoine. And um, we've already heard about the demand for privacy quite a lot today. So when we think about how the market for data privacy operates, we know quite a lot about the demand side. So we know that in a lot of contexts, it's been shown that consumers are quite passive, that they're quite willing to give away their data. Uh, there's a privacy paradox and there have been attempts to measure willingness to pay, such as the paper we've just seen. And in this context, we think it's also important to understand a bit more about the supply of privacy. So to understand a bit more what determines how firms decide to extract and share data, how firms decide um, in general to collect consumer information and how they present their policies to consumers. So how they write privacy contracts or privacy policies that, that you see on a lot of websites. And that's, so that's the question that we're gonna drill down on in this paper. So we're gonna start with the data collection exercise. So we're gonna take a comprehensive set of US firms and we're going to see what they say about privacy. So for each of these firms, we're going to scrape the text of their privacy policy, if they have one. We're going to ask, what does that text mean a little bit? So we've, we're going to use both sort of um, numerical ways to evaluate that, but also we've sent these policies for evaluation by a legal expert. And then the third part of data that we collect is what they actually do. So we're going to measure at the same time as the privacy policies, we've scraped information on um, how much data they actually extract uh, via cookies uh, from people that visit their website. Then we're going to document a few status facts using the variation across firms in this data that we think are interesting. So the, the first thing we'll show is that most of the variation is within industries. Uh, so there's no such thing as an industry boilerplate privacy policy. There seems to be much more variation across firms with different characteristics in each industry. We're also going to show a fact about the link between what they say and what they do. And uh, that link is that data extraction, intensive data extraction via cookies is associated with long, sophisticated and clearly visible privacy policies. And the third fact we'll show is um, to do with the systematic variation in these attributes across firm characteristics. We're going to focus in particular about how firms act when they have different size and a different technical sophistication. And with these facts in hand, I'm going to offer some preliminary economic interpretations. I say preliminary because we, we would like to eventually have a model that gives more structural content to our results, but we're not quite there yet. So at the moment, I'm going to give you what is our interpretation of what this means for competing theories of, of how this market works. So we're going to think about rational models of consumer behavior versus models that cast 
data extraction is more of a shrouded attribute or more that something that consumers maybe don't fully understand. And we're also going to think about what our results mean for the distribution of uh, data extraction technologies across firms. So I'll go straight in with the data. We look at essentially all firms in CompuStat US subject to some filters. We have about 5,000 firms there. And uh, we try to find the privacy policy for each of them. We start with an automated Google search, followed by another web crawling exercise, followed by manual checking if the, if the automated uh, versions don't work. And so you have some of the summary stats here on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, out of the roughly 5,300 firms, we found a policy for about 4,000. And this policy was clearly visible for about 3,500. When I say clearly visible, we mean that there is a link on the homepage when you visit that firm's website that says something like privacy policy and you can get there in one click. That's going to be an important measure of sort of accessibility or visibility that we'll use throughout the paper. Here's just a little word cloud to show you that the data that we collect really is about privacy. The most prominent terms used in, these, in this corpus of text that we acquire is things like personal information, personal data, third parties, privacy policy, etc. So it's just the, the kind of legal language that you would expect. Here are a few histograms that show you the attributes of privacy policies. On the left, you've got the number of words in each policy, which is on a log scale ranging from about 100 for the shortest ones to about 10,000 words for the longest. Similarly, paragraphs somewhere between one and 100 in the middle chart. And the chart on the right shows something called the FOG index, which heuristically uh, means the years of formal education needed to read a document. It's, it was developed by someone named Gunning in the 1950s. Take that interpretation with a pinch of salt. But if you, if you plot this, you see that the modal education you need to read some of these policies, to read these policies is a college degree. If you only have high school, you can't read any of them and for quite a significant chunk of the sample, you need a PhD. So these are generally quite technical documents that we're looking at. The other part of the data set that we acquire is data extraction behavior. This is a user's technology developed in a computer science paper by Engelhardt and Narayanan called the Open Web Privacy Measurement Scraper. And here are a few of the metrics that come out of this. Again, I've drawn the histograms across the firms in our sample for which we can uh, get this information. For example, first party cookies are cookies that the firm themselves, the firms themselves place on their own websites in order to extract information about the people that visit. That ranges somewhere between zero and 30. There's quite a lot of zeros and the mode is around five. Third party requests and third party tracking cookies. The other two charts here measure the extent to which other firms place cookies on the firm's website, which are things that happen when you use tools like Google Analytics. You get a free service from a third party that the third party often insists on then putting a cookie on your website, which tracks the people that visit your website. And again, you've got a, you've got a distribution that looks similar to the first party cookies. You've got quite a lot of zeros and quite a long right tail. There are some firms that are really active in terms of data extraction. These are quite highly correlated. So first and third party data extraction are quite, uh, have a correlation of about 60%. So we're going to use the total number of cookies of first plus third party as the baseline measure of data extraction going forward. We then, just, just as an extra, we send some of these policies, a sample of about 350 of them to a legal expert who was doing, um, a master's at the LSE at the time and is now a, now a corporate lawyer. And we asked him to rank the sophistication of the text contained in each policy along various dimensions, but I'm only going to show you the, the overall rating uh, where you've got the distribution of scores on the right there. He was asked to rate them on a three point scale, low, neutral or high, where high is something that is very legally sophisticated and low is something quite bad from a legal perspective. Uh, you can see that his scores discriminate reasonably well about out of the 350, about half of them are neutral and the others are evenly distributed between low and high. 
And so from this information, we can construct a legal sophistication index that we apply to all policies in the sample, which would just say, we're gonna use the frequency of the top 100 bigrams, bigram being a sequence of two words, in the policies rated high, we subtract from that the frequency of the top 100 bigrams in policies rated low. So it's kind of the difference between the word cloud on the left here and the word cloud on the right. And we see you know, how, how often does each firm mention the terms in the word cloud on the left and we subtract from that how often do you mention the ones on the right. And that just gives you some, uh, an index. There are other indices that we've tried and that give similar results. It gives you an index of legal sophistication across the whole sample. Okay, now I'll show you uh, some of the facts that we think are interesting in this data. So the first thing that we worried about coming to the project is uh, what if in every industry, there's just one law firm that writes privacy policies for everybody. Everybody calls them up, gets the boilerplate, puts it on their website and they're done. So we want to examine a little bit the, variant, the decomposition of the variation within and between industries to see whether that's the case. So what we've plotted here is a measure called cosine similarity, which kind of, if you, if you think of a document as a vector of words, it, the cosine similarity is the angle between the vectors represented by two documents. So if that angle is large, if that angle is, um, is uh, well, if cosine similarity is one, then the angle is zero, and they're basically saying the same thing. If cosine similarity is zero, then the angle is 90 degrees, and they're kind of orthogonal. That's how you should think about this chart. So that's on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we've plotted the cumulative share of firms that have a co cosine similarity um, below each value on the between zero and one. And the cosine similarity relative to the average in a, in, a re in a comparison group. Okay, so if you look at the dark blue line, the top line in the chart, that is the distribution, the cumulative distribution of cosine similarities between each firm's privacy policy and the average privacy policy in our data. Okay, you can see that, for example, the median is somewhere around 0.5. Okay, and then the, the other CDFs on the chart, the other distributions, we are using um, successively finer industry classifications. We go from sample to sector, from sector to SIG2, and from SIG2 to SIG3. And so, for example, the light blue line, the bottom line in the chart, is the distribution of cosine similarities between each firm's privacy policy and the average policy in their SIG3 bucket. Okay, and you can see that controlling for the industry fixed effects in this way doesn't really move the needle. The cosine similarity distribution stays roughly the same. There's not a huge amount of movement, which shows you this is sort of the equivalent in, in the text world of a variance decomposition into within and between industry variation. Right? The takeaway here is that most of the variation in the text in the privacy policies is within industries. And this only changes slightly if instead of using raw documents, we use a sort of, if we use a topic model to condense the information a little bit further. Another thing that's interesting that you could look at is if in, in addition to controlling for the industry buckets, we control for a firm characteristic such as market value. So here we've controlled for the market value quintile, um, then this moves a lot more. Okay, so it seems to be more firm characteristics as opposed to industry characteristics that drive uh, privacy policies. So equipped with that, we're going to look a little bit more at the relationship between privacy policies or the content of privacy policies and so what they say and uh, cookies, what they do. Okay, so in each of these charts on the horizontal axis, you've got a, a binned version of our total cookies variable. So the first slab in each chart is going to be people that have between zero and 10, then 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 60, where 60 is the max in the data. And um, we're going to look at various attributes of the privacy policy and see how they relate to actual data extraction behavior. On the top two charts, you've got 
the indicator for whether we found a policy and the indicator for whether that policy was clearly visible. In both cases, you can see a clear upward trend. So there's a significant difference in that firms that have a lot of data extraction make their policies easier to find. The two bottom charts show similarly that firms who have a lot of, who conduct a lot of data extraction have longer policies, so a higher number of words, and uh, more legally sophisticated policies, according to the index that I've described earlier. Okay, so the takeaway is that tracking or data extraction is associated with visible but complex privacy policies. The same thing holds true when we remove sector fixed effects from both set the X and the Y variable in these plots. So again, this is mostly within industry variation. Now, let me go a little bit into what the economic interpretation of these facts so far might be. So let's think about if we were, if we were to write down a model of supply and demand of consumer data slash privacy, what would it be? One possible view would be a rational model of the market for privacy, right? So firms conduct a certain amount of data extraction, they communicate it to consumers and then consumers rationally evaluate whether or not their participation constraint is satisfied. And then if it is, so if you know they're getting their $33 from the last paper or whatever, then, then they go ahead and do business with this one. Right? That would be sort of the stand, the canonical model to start with. So in that model, you would predict that firms who intend to extract data will write a long sophisticated policy which lays out what they're going to do so that consumers can read those policies and decide whether they are willing to participate. But in this view, in this model, it's somewhat surprising that we find that policies are more visible for firms who do a lot of data extraction, a lot of tracking. Right? Because in a rational model, if I'm not involved in any data extraction, I should make a lot of noise about that because other things equal, people don't like to share their data. So in the rational consumer world, I would probably make it very visible if I'm not extracting any data, I would have a very visible privacy policy that just says, I will not extract any data. And um, we've repeated our empirical analysis by restricting the sample, for example, to the service industry, where firms are naturally dealing with consumer and consumer data. So the apps, this visibility result is not just driven by the fact that some firms' businesses are obviously orthogonal uh, to consumer data. Okay, so it's not just because there's manufacturing firms who don't bother having a privacy policy. It's, it's, it actually also holds true in consumer facing industries. So we find, you know, to some extent, our results are consistent with this rational model, but to some extent, uh, we find that there's something else going on. Another possible view of the world, which is quite a natural view in light of all this literature on the privacy paradox, is a model of data extraction as a shrouded attribute following Gebex and Leibson. So in such a model, you would predict that firms who extract data will also write long sophisticated policies, so, but with the intention that nobody will read them. Right? They, they, they make them deliberately hard uh, to understand and, and deliberately long. And by doing so, the reason they do it is because by doing so, they can extract more data from consumers that Gabex and Leibson call myopic. What myopic means in their model is that consumers assume that the shrouded thing that they cannot understand is benign. It means that the firm is not going to do anything bad to them or not going to extract any data. Whereas there's other, mod other consumers in the model who are sophisticated and have rational expectations and then value privacy. So if they see something shrouded that they cannot understand, they will assume the worst rationally. Okay. But if there's a high enough measure of myopic consumers, then it's optimal for the firm to do engage in some shrouding in, in their model. Okay. So that's consistent also with the, with the empirical finding that, you know, data extraction is associated with long sophisticated policies, but now you're seeing that fact in a different light. 
And in this view, I think it's quite easy also to rationalize the visibility results. So it might be rational in a model like this for firms who track or who extract a lot of data to provide high visibility as a sort of superficial reassurance to consumers. Right? So there is a privacy policy. So the myopic consumers say, oh, there's a privacy policy, so it's fine. And then they assume that it's benign. Okay. We, we still want to write this model down more explicitly, but this is currently our, our reading of the data. And um, yeah, so our results are consistent with, with this model. Um, and this model, I think, is also a natural candidate to look at in this space in general, just because it can explain the empirical literature on the privacy paradox uh, very effortlessly. And it sort of rings true with introspection because I've never read a privacy policy other than to write this paper. Okay, so let me go a little bit further with the data. So we're now going to look at uh, how, whether there is systematic variation in privacy policies uh, uh, that correlates with firm characteristics. I'm going to zoom in on two characteristics in particular, which is firm's market value and something called the knowledge capital share, which is defined in a paper by Peters and Taylor as uh, the capital that a firm accumulates through R&D divided by its total assets. So that's kind of a measure of firm's technical sophistication that we will use here. So the histograms are at the top of the slide. Market value, standard distribution, and CompuStat, it's sort of quite, this is a log scale, so it's quite a long right tail. Um, knowledge capital share, there's a lot of zeros. And then as again, it ranges up to, uh, we've Windsorized it at 0.75, but again, it, it, it basically covers the whole range. So there's a lot of variation in how technically sophisticated firms are. So we're going to relate these two variables to uh, what they say, so the attributes of privacy policies and what they do, the data extraction behavior. Here's just a sample of those relationships. So for ex here, we have sorted firms by market value, so size, into quintiles along the horizontal axis in each chart. On the left, you can see that there's a significant difference, a significant upward trend. As you go to larger firms, you will see more legal clarity, uh, you will, in the middle chart, it shows that as you go to larger firms, you will need significantly more education to understand their policies. And on the right, you see that as you go to larger firms, you will also have more data extracted from you via cookies. And so there's, the, again, the positive association between sophisticated policies and, and data extraction. It, it also, it's systematic across um, firm sites. Large firms also have longer policies that are easier to find, again, consistently with what we said before. What we find quite interesting is the relationship between the same variables and uh, the firm's knowledge share. So again, on the horizontal axis here, we have binned knowledge share into zeros and then uh, tercials conditional on not being zero, which we call low, medium, and high. And you can see that um, in terms of legal clarity in the left chart, the medium group, the medium knowledge share group of firms is by far the most sophisticated in terms of their legal text. And on the right chart here, you can see again that the medium group is by far the most active in data extraction in terms of cookies. There is a similar relationship with the, with the FOG index, but it's not statistically significant in the middle chart. If we repeat the same thing in a regression, and there are lots of regressions in the paper that probe the robustness of this finding, but you find consistently that if you look at any outcome variable that I've discussed, such as policy found, policy visible, number of words, legal sophistication, fog index, and cookies, you will, you will get a positive coefficient on knowledge share and a negative coefficient on the knowledge share squared, which again suggests this nonlinear relationship where the people with intermediate knowledge shares are the ones that really engage in uh, data extraction and the ones that write long, sophisticated and visible privacy policies. And here we've controlled for industry fix effects and, and other variables as well. So again, I think it's interesting to discuss a little bit what this might mean for the economics. So we found a robust nonlinear relationship between technical sophistication and data extraction. And this suggests that data extraction technology might have sort of multiple dimensions across firms. Uh, so on one hand, you find that sophisticated firms 
find it more valuable to collect data because they probably have a better capability to monetize it. They have a more sophisticated tech team or data analysis team, or they know how to sell this data in secondary markets to, to make some money or to get some free services. So, you know, it makes sense that they would be more active. On the other hand, it seems like the most sophisticated firms are, in a, are playing a different game altogether. As it seems the most sophisticated firms might have different technologies altogether. For example, the most sophisticated firms might themselves be data intermediaries that acquire data from other sources, such as from other firms. If you think about it, Google knows a lot about you, even if they don't track you when you visit google.com. They know a lot about you because they have Google Analytics and they track you everywhere else. And that would be one explanation. Another one would be that the most sophisticated firms have modern tracking technology, which is hard to detect and goes beyond just using cookies, for example, device fingerprinting. The paper we cited earlier, the Engelhardt and the Rainham paper is a very nice read if you want to learn about all the devious ways in which people can, can now extract data from you. It's quite scary. But again, it could be that the, the most sophisticated, the, the downward bend is not because they've stopped extracting data, but because they do it in a way that nobody can actually tell. And so I think that, but the important lesson here is I think there's a heterogen, there's heterogeneity along at least two dimensions of technology and uh, firms in terms of data extraction. Okay, I'll conclude here. Uh, so we've assembled a comprehensive data set for studying the market for privacy, focusing on the supply side. We have some new stylized facts and I've offered some evaluation of different economic models uh, of the market for privacy, which we think uh, should be interesting for future research. A quick advertising break. Everything is on GitHub, all the data, all the code. Uh, so you can play with it yourself. You can merge it with CompuStat. And um, you know, if you need it for your research, it's all there. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Ansgar, for a very, very good and thorough presentation. So we have a couple of questions. The first one comes from Manoj, who is asking, um, where government firms included in the sample? So is there any difference in behavior between private and public sector firms? I think these are all private firms. Oh, okay. So we so, haven't actually looked not, at not the, the public sector. Yeah. I see. It. And I think Anand Goel also has a question, but I think you partially answered. So his comment was that there may be a cost of consumer attention for long complex policies. So such policies are avoided if the firm is not collecting data. Firms which are collecting data may write comprehensive policies and make them prominent to reduce legal risk. But I think this is kind of uh, what you covered towards uh, the, the end of um, the, the talk, but I don't know if you want to kind of comment on this. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good point. I think that, you know, how exactly legal risk plays out uh, will determine what the optimal policy is. So maybe you only, if the only thing you're concerned about is not getting sued, then this makes perfect sense. But I think there's another thing that firms are naturally concerned about, which is this part participation constraint of consumers. And, and I think that actually drives things in a slightly different direction from not getting sued. And that's, that's why I was emphasizing earlier on. But I, I, I think it's a, it's a fair point from an end. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, and I'm uh, very kind of not knowledgeable about this uh, area, but what do you have a sense of how uh, legally this uh, kind of uh, uh, lawsuits would be handled? Because I mean, if you have that within the same industry, you have that there are very different, uh, uh, there are huge disparity in the privacy policies. It is not clear to me that uh, uh, it wouldn't be the case that um, a court would be making rulings that are based on kind of um, policies that are not specific to the company, but they are mainly like what is the industry standard. But I really don't know how this would actually work out. I don't know if you have any yeah, comments. In terms that. of actual lawsuits, and again, I'm not a legal expert, but my understanding there is at least in the US, it's usually the government that sues companies who've infringed on privacy law. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's, and they, they usually pick out individual companies uh, at, because for individual companies, they have some kind of uh, smoking gun that they can use in court. So that, that's the way it usually works. Yes. And then I have another last question for you from Christian Wagner is uh, asking, well, if a company extracts data not using cookies, wouldn't such efforts 
be mentioned in the privacy policies. I mean, you had this idea of uh, Google uh, not having uh, tracking you, but tracking indirectly. Wouldn't be this action uh, need to be disclosed by these companies? I assume it would, but mm -hmm. if you're sufficiently confident that nobody can ever tell, <laughs> you might not disclose it. I'm not saying that any of this is going on. Um, I have no evidence that people are doing things and not disclosing them. We haven't mined the text sufficiently to actually link the, the behaviors we see in the tracking data to, be, to the words in the text. So I can't comment on that, but that, it's not, all I'm saying is it's not 100% clear, right? That, and as technology gets more and more sophisticated, it might be more and more tempting not to disclose everything you're doing because it's really hard for anyone to tell what you're doing in any future lawsuit. So again, I think that's an open question and it's a, it's a good point. Okay, but thank I'll you. Thank so everyone for your, for your questions. Yeah, thank you Ansgar for a great paper presentation. So let's move on to the third paper, the is titled When FinTech Meets Privacy, the Consequences of Personal Information Misuse in Debt Collection. And um, we have uh, uh, Li Liao, Zhengwei Huang, Hongjun Wang, and Kongi Zhu, and uh, as well as uh, uh, Yun uh, Jun Yang um, on the paper, and the presenter is going to be Hong Jun. Hong Jun, you can take it away. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me and see the slides? Perfectly, yeah. All right, great. Uh, thank you so much for including our paper. Actually, uh, we have been working really hard on the paper, revising not only the uh, content of the paper, but also the co-author list. We actually have uh, Jun Yang now working with us. So she's also online, uh, probably will join me to answer questions. And Li, Zheng Wei, and Tong Yi, they are all from Tsinghua University. So this is a great conference. We have seen two uh, great papers on the, both the demand and supply of privacy. But now let's switch gear a little bit and venture to the dark side. So we are actually looking at the uh, actual uh, infringement of privacy. As people often say, you really have to look at the dark side to actually shed light on difficult questions. So in order to explain to you what kind of difficult questions we have in mind, let me now bring you over to um, a very old thought experiment. So imagine yourself walking to a lab, a stranger came to you and offered you a choice between $20 and zero. Probably that's too boring a choice, everybody with the increasing utility function would choose $20. But until I tell you the context of the choice, it turns out the stranger, his name is Mr. Very Annoying. And it turns out what happened is he got $100 from the experimenter and his choice, his decision is to split it between himself and you. For some reason, he decided he, de he himself deserves $80 and only offers you $20. And you have a choice to either accept the offer to take the $20 and accept the, the really annoying fact that he's gonna walk away with $80 and laughing, or alternatively, you can choose to reject the offer, in which case you get zero and he also gets zero. As it turns out, a large fraction of people would be happy to take zero over 20 with the purpose of penalizing Mr. Noy. And many of you probably recognize that this is the famous automaton bargaining experiment. And the concept here is more about fairness. And if people came up with a term about it, they call this negative reciprocity. The idea is that because you, when you, sometimes when you feel the situation so unfair, you would rather make a choice that hurts you financially in order to hurt the person who is doing the injustice to you. And this also works both ways. There can be a positive reciprocity as well. Let me make it absolutely clear, this is not only a, a, a concept that is uh, dreamed out by uh, uh, game theorists. Economists have thought about this for quite a while and some prominent uh, economists, some Nobel Prize winners, uh, some future winners, and they believe this concept plays a key role in a number of very important questions, issues in economics from labor economics, like the uh, George Arkeloff has a pioneering work on efficiency, um, efficient wage, and even for a basic uh, business cycle question, and the fairness probably played a role as well. And George Arkeloff again made a very important contribution there. 
But you may be wondering why we don't hear about this concept more often than it deserves. Well, the reason is really difficult to study. For such a great uh, important issue, the only evidence we have so far, pretty much most of it is based on experiments because it's very difficult to conduct a direct empirical studies. And the, the perhaps the most successful progress we have made is really about uh, labor economics. That's where we get some indirect evidence that negative reciprocity probably played a role in the labor market. But other than that, we are basically relying on experimental evidence, and we're hoping that our paper can contribute here. So let me give you a little bit of background at the market that we studied. And this market is called cash loan market. And well, that's a literal translation. This is a market in China. It's actually a misnomer because in this market, there's no cash. Everything is digital. It's uh, uh, organized by the fintech firms. You can think of those loans as uncollateralized micro loans. And typically they are very short term, uh, less than 12 months. They're similar to the payday loans in uh, on many aspects like uncollateralized uh, micro, uh, micro loans. And they, as a result, you can imagine the default rate in this market is relatively high. And they, uh, another important issue is here, debt collection is extremely important for the business model. As you can see in our sample period, 49% of the loans end up uh, face some late payment issues. And in the end, 10% of the loans end up in default. As a result, you have to work really hard on the uh, data, uh, debt collection to reduce the default rate because the um, late payment is so prevalent. Almost half of the loans bump into those kind of issues. So let me talk about the uh, data collect uh, debt collection issue. Um, since, as I mentioned, this is online business. You cannot just hire people and go to their houses to collect the debt. Instead, you have to mostly rely on phone calls and text messages. But very quickly, those uh, lenders realized it's not gonna work. And then uh, from October 2015, they came up with something that is pretty dramatic. So here's what they do. After realizing it's difficult to collect uh, those debts, they actually hire some debt collectors to contact not the borrowers themselves, rather they're contacting the key contacts of the borrowers, meaning their families and friends. So they're gonna make phone calls to their family and friends of the borrower, the delinquent borrower, and telling them, hey, Mr. A is late in his payment. Can you please help us to convince him to repay? The goal here, obviously, is to put pressure on the uh, borrower. And in many cases, actually, they, the contacts offered to pay the loans on the borrower's behalf. For example, uh, college students, and when their parents realized their kids got involved uh, in those kind of uh, nasty situation, and they, they, they probably will just pay the uh, debt for their uh, kids. So let me show you, uh, uh, briefly mention the main result before I tell you more about the institutional details. So we tried a number of different strategies uh, to estimate the causal effect of debt collection. It turns out in this case, given the nature of the debt collection practice, it appears that the borrowers get really pissed off. The debt collection did not reduce the default rate, rather it actually increased the default rate. According to our estimate, the numbers I'm gonna show you, based on one uh, identification strategy, is ranging from five to 15% among the delinquent borrowers. In other words, if you have the set of delinquent borrowers where the default rate is, let's say, 35%. If you make phone calls to their families and friends, the default rate now increases from 35 to 40 or from 35 to 50%. And that looks pretty much like negative reciprocity. It appears that the borrowers get mad and retaliate. And in order to shed more light on it, we examined the cross-sectional variation in this effect. So now let's imagine when would people retaliate and how much would they retaliate? Obviously, the more offensive the practice is, the more likely people are gonna retaliate. It also depends on how grumpy the borrowers are, right? Because the, the, the more easily you get mad about something, when you get uh, triggered, you're gonna retaliate more often. And also depends on the capacity. 
if you have the capacity, if you can afford to really retaliate, then you're going to be more likely to retaliate. So in terms of offensiveness and the, the proxy we are hoping to use is based on the voluntary information that the borrowers uh, will provide. I will explain to you more details on the application process. At one step, the borrowers are asked to provide uh, information voluntarily about their Taobao account, which is their record in online shopping. And the, the, the idea is that for those who agreed to provide the Taobao account, they probably trusted this lender exactly a little bit more than those who are more cautious did not provide. As a result, exposed when they see the debt collection practice, they got more mad and they are gonna retaliate with a higher probability. It also depends on how grumpy the, the borrower is. And there has been uh, some uh, evidence where they, they actually measure people's testosterone level. And they find in this um, uh, experiment that people with higher testosterone level can retaliate more uh, severely. And obviously we cannot measure the testosterone level in our uh, borrowers, and but we know they are uh, among male borrowers, their testosterone level naturally are higher than female, so that's another variation we're going to look at. And we find that male borrowers actually respond uh, more severely. And the final one is on capacity. So now imagine you're, you're going to really uh, uh, go against the debt collectors, you're going to face pretty bad consequences, you're hurting yourself. But on top of that, you also have to consider if I repay my debt, I can still use this lender as an emergency uh, funding uh, source. But if I don't, I, how do I find an, an alternative source? That will be the capacity issue. And that's where we are using the credit rating. And the idea is that for those with higher credit rating, presumably they have a better outside option, better chances to uh, get funding from other places. And indeed, we find that the borrowers with higher credit rating, they actually retaliate more they decided not to pay uh, more uh, uh, with a higher probability. That actually goes against the intuition based on the capacity to repay, right? Presumably the borrowers with higher rating, they should have a higher capacity to repay. They should pay uh, with a higher uh, positive response to the debt collection, but it turns out it's actually negative and more strong, uh, uh, consistent with the reciprocity idea rather than capacity to repay. And in the end, we also tested an alternative interpretation, which is based on liquidity constraints. Remember, the, the collection is such that the lender actually um, go out to call the borrowers, the family, and friends. Presumably, that would damage their reputation among their friends. A social network, they're going to have a harder time to borrow from them. And as a result, they may face a liquidity constraint and have a higher chance to default. That will be consistent with our uh, um, result as well. And we try to shed light on this interpretation by looking at actually how they consume after they run into delinquency. We actually can obtain their online consumption data to see whether their consumption actually uh, changes um, after they get into delinquency, after they get uh, the uh, debt collection practice. It turns out we cannot detect any evidence that those uh, who are collected, meaning their family and friends are called, behave any differently from other uh, borrowers. And, it, and also important point is that perhaps this is not only driven by the uh, statistical power of consumption data, because we actually can detect clearly that the consumption level goes down before the borrowers enter into delinquency. In other words, our data set actually has statistical power to detect consumption difference, but we cannot detect the difference between collected and uncollected uh, borrowers. So now let me uh, uh, provide you more institutional details before we get into the uh, identification. So this cash loan industry started in China roughly in 24, uh, 2020, uh, 2012 and grows very rapidly uh, after 2014. At the end of 2017, uh, we have over 30 million borrowers and the aggregate loan amount accumulated over 100 billion RMB. So that is a re really large uh, market. Uh, there's a good reason why it grow uh, so rapidly in China. So, but the reason uh, uh, perhaps not too relevant uh, for today. So now let me tell you the application procedure. In order to uh, apply for a loan from the cash loan lender, obviously you need to first install the app. Well. When you install the app, you have to agree to 
um, let the lender to collect information from your phone. And meaning they can actually collect the contacts and text messages and phone call record from your, uh, your, your device. And another thing is when you apply, you need to, uh, to register to open an account, you need to provide your national ID number, which is uh, like the social security number. You also need to provide the number of your debit card, which is linked to your bank account, such that the lender can actually directly deposit uh, the loan to your bank account directly. And finally, you need to provide a, a cell phone record. After providing all the information and agree to let the lender to collect uh, your information, now the lender will go ahead to do a credit evaluation and where they will obtain your historical borrowing record, the criminal record, the public penalty record, et cetera, et cetera. Based on that data, the lender can come up with a credit score if your score is above certain threshold, which is relatively low, and the applicant will be offered a credit line. And after that, the uh, uh, applicant can withdraw from the credit line and to get a funding instant within a matter of seconds. And also after that, the um, borrower can provide additional data, which is optional. And for example, you can provide the information about your Taobao account, which is about your online, uh, uh, online purchase record. And by doing that, you may be able to increase your credit limit as well. In our sample, we have about 80% of the borrowers who provided their Taobao account. So I mentioned the debt collection has been an important part of this business. And after uh, October 2015, the practice is standardized uh, as follows. So if a loan is late for three days, and during which the lender obviously will make contact with the borrower, ask them to uh, repay, actually many of them repay. But if after three days, they still don't repay, and they will transfer this loan to their debt collection uh, department and provide the debt collector the key contact because they can access your phone, they can figure out who are the closest contacts uh, on the phone. And they will, uh, from day four, they will start making phone calls uh, to the borrower's key contact, putting pressure on them. And the important feature for us is that there are way too many delinquent borrowers. They simply do not have enough debt collectors. For the uh, lender we are working with, they actually have more than 200 debt collectors uh, at the height of this business. Even so, even after hiring 200 debt collectors, they still cannot uh, collect everyone. Let me, uh, this table has a lot of numbers. Maybe let me just show you one, which is uh, the mean of collect dummy, which is 77%, meaning for the sample we are looking at, they only managed to collect 77% of them, simply because they don't have enough manpower to make the phone calls to their close contact. And that actually gives us the identification strategy, because if you want to measure the uh, causal effect of debt collection, you cannot directly compare the default rate for those borrowers who are collected versus those who are not collected, because if you do that, you will see that for those um, uh, borrowers which, who are collected, meaning their family and friends are contacted, the default rate is 38%. For the other group where uh, there's no collection, it's almost 60%. So you, you, might, you will have to draw the wrong conclusion that the debt collection is working. But obviously that's not the case. And from the interviews with the debt collection department, they clearly stated their strategy. They're gonna collect the borrowers who they think are gonna be more likely to repay their debt. So in other words, they're gonna sort the borrowers according to their assessment they will work on the, according to the list. The top of the list, they have the borrowers who are gonna be most likely to repay. The bottom of the list has borrowers who are least likely to repay. And not only from interviews, we actually have a number of, a, a few pieces of evidence uh, supporting this claim. Let me just get those uh, uh, evidence, uh, directly get to our uh, strategy. At the end of the discussion, if uh, you're interested, we can talk about the evidence we have there to support this uh, strategy. So here's the procedure. After ranking the borrowers according to their assessment of the uh, chance of repay, and they're gonna chop it up, uh, give it to uh, other debt collectors. For each debt collector, the people on the top are roughly the 
the best uh, to work on, meaning they are most likely to repay. At the bottom, they are gonna be less likely to repay. Then the debt uh, collectors will start calling people, uh, working hard until the end of the day when they get tired or when they want to stop, because those debt collectors can work with a very flexible schedule. They can stop at any, any time they want, and most likely it's, it's, they're gonna stop for their personal reasons. So as you can see on the graph, each person stops at a different time. And the point is we're gonna use the uncollected borrowers with those collected borrowers who are just above this uh, cutoff point. They are collected at the last, say, uh, a, a couple of hours before the debt collector uh, stopped working. Presumably those uh, borrowers are more comparable. So we can estimate the uh, treatment effect. Let me visualize the identification strategy and without the ability to point to the screen. Now, if you look at it, and I just uh, put two characteristics, imagine those are the characteristics that determine the repayment propensity. And if you work your way from the bottom left corner to the upper right corner, and the um, borrowers are gonna become less and less likely to uh, repay. As a result, you can imagine the collectors start working from the bottom left corner, work their way up to the upper right corner. And at the end of the day, uh, when they call it off, uh, the stop working, they stop. The, the cutoff line will be the blue line. The red dots are the borrowers who are collected. The black dots are the borrowers who are not collected. Our strategy obviously is to identify those borrowers uh, around this uh, cutoff uh, point uh, line and so they are more comparable. And for this subsample, whether um, a borrower is collected or not is totally determined by randomness of those uh, borrower's personal action. And utilizing this randomness, we can estimate the treatment effect. We actually have three different identification strategies. The first one is based on the measure using all the uh, uh, observables uh, among uh, borrowers to identify those along the cutoff points. The second one is to use a propensity score regression to identify those along the uh, cutoff line. And the final one, perhaps the least intrusive one, the most transparent one, is based on the phone call time. Even though uh, we do not know uh, when the uh, uh, collector start working and stop for each one of them, but we know roughly uh, the later uh, time of a day, it's going to be more likely to be the borrowers who are collected towards the end of their list. So the one way we do it, we realize they start collecting from nine o'clock in the morning. They stop, in the end, they stop working at rough after 10, 11, or even a few are collected at almost midnight. And the idea is that if we make a cutoff at four o'clock, for example, for those who are collected after four o'clock, they're gonna be located towards the bottom of the list, at least more likely. So that would be the idea. And then if you take the subsample, which include the collected borrowers who are collected after four o'clock and those uncollected borrowers, then let's run a regression to estimate the treatment effect. And then you can move the cutoff point from four o'clock to five, six, seven, eight, all the way to 10, and that's what you get. So let me walk you through this table. First column gives you the cutoff point, and I highlighted the row at 16, the four o'clock in the afternoon. If you use the cutoff time of four o'clock, you the subsample of after uh, the collected uh, borrowers after four o'clock versus and those uncollected borrowers. And if you run the probability regression of default on collect, which is the dummy variable that is one if the borrower is collected, you will get a positive significant coefficient of uh, positive 0 0.17, uh, 197. And if you translate that into the probability of the default rate, it gives you something like a 5% uh, default rate, meaning the debt collection increased the default rate by 5%. And if you move the cutoff points uh, late towards the later uh, uh, time of the day, for example, go to uh, 10 o'clock, 11, uh, sorry, 8, 9, even 10, you will see this marginal effect keep increasing, the point estimate keeps increasing. Obviously, the standard error also increases as well because you have fewer and fewer uh, observations in your regression. Exactly as we uh, expected because if you cut up more the cut point to a later time of the day and the remaining collected borrowers are going to be more similar to the uncollected borrowers then your estimate of the treatment effect will be more accurate obviously you're going to suffer 
sacrifice uh, data points and the standard error will increase a little bit. So to look at the uh, cross-sectional variation and uh, of the responses, because our interpretation is that really the borrowers uh, get mad then retaliate. And we are hoping to look at uh, different aspects of this uh, retaliation. As I mentioned, how uh, offensive the debt collection is to the borrower would determine the magnitude of the response. And also the, the gender of the uh, borrower also is an important driver. Finally, the capacity, whether the, the borrower has an alternative source of funding will determine uh, the, uh, uh, whether they are gonna retaliate. Um, so let me show you a few graphs before I stop. So the first one is uh, Taobao, whether you provide a Taobao account. Our interpretation is that if you provide Taobao account, probably you were more trusting. Now you feel like the, uh, a stronger sense of betrayal, then you're gonna retaliate more often. As you see in the plot, uh, the, those with the, who provide Taobao account, the, the uh, treatment effect is stronger. Those who did not provide Taobao account, the treatment is uh, weaker. And similarly for gender, and if you look at the male and the female, the male borrowers uh, have a much stronger response, presumably due to the uh, uh, stronger, uh, more, more anger they feel after they feel uh, the mistreatment. And th this one is about credit rating. Uh, it turns out the lender actually rank the borrowers according uh, at the time of application classify them into the six categories from A to F, where A, the highest credit rating, F is the lowest. As you can see that for those, uh, those with the highest rating, the response is much stronger than the lowest. And this is consistent with the retaliation and with the capacity to retaliate rather than the ability to repay. So finally, this is a graph for the consumption I mentioned. Let me briefly uh, uh, tell you the story behind it because the, uh, we can track their online consumption in Taobao, which accounts for 80% of online shopping. And even though this is not a full picture of the consumption, at least it's suggestive. And the one interesting thing we noticed is that uh, if you track the borrower's consumption, you will see that at time, the horizontal axis is time. Zero is the delinquency time. You will see that from more than three months before delinquency time, the online consumption start decreasing. Presumably they were, they were getting into trouble. And after that, we're comparing collected and uncollected borrowers. We don't see a difference in their consumption uh, differences. So presumably our data is good enough to detect consumption change, but we cannot detect any difference between collected and uncollected. And time is almost up, let me wrap up. So um, to our knowledge, this is first empirical study directly analyzing the negative uh, reciprocity. Um, uh, we, see, uh, we demonstrate this in a um, uh, financial market in China. We find that the privacy infringement actually make people borrowers uh, angry and they retaliate. And we explore the cross-sectional re uh, variation in this uh, responses, as well as the ruling out the alternative ex explanation of liquidity constraints. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hongjun, for also a fantastic presentation. So I think we have, uh, uh, we actually received a lot of comments <laughs> and uh, June was actually kind of really, really responsive. So she took care of uh, a number of them. Um, but uh, I wanted to highlight um, uh, a couple of comments that were raised by Will and um, uh, Juan Tang. So Will Song and Wan Tang, and also I had myself. So Will uh, kind of opens uh, this. Uh, I, I guess the the, uh, the the overall arching the the overarching theme is uh, whether this is a unique result in the literature uh, and why that is the case. So uh, Will is writing. Uh, when I first saw the setup, I was expecting that social pressure would uh, reduce default, and I think also there is a paper um, the by Ha Deep Wen called the social collateral. And uh, also one uh, kind of highlights another paper uh, by um, Bruza, Lu, and Fang. And so these papers seem to, seem to show that uh, borrowers uh, kind of uh, respond positively to the threat of disclosing delinquency. And so it seems to be the case that uh, whenever individuals have uh, facing this threat of uh, this uh, disclosure, then they are um, uh, willing to repay, but the moment they actual they they feel uh, they kind of they experience the actual action of telling this uh, information to their social network. Then they retaliate and um, react negatively. Is this your the way you read the results as well, Anjun? Uh, 
Uh, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. So we're not saying that social pressure doesn't work. It actually works, even in our data set. We have some new results that we uh, cannot put into this presentation. For example, uh, in this particular setup we are analyzing, uh, there is an interesting subgroup where the social pressure is really, really strong among college students. And they can do a lot more than uh, uh, for other borrowers where they, they, they simply cannot reach them. But the students, they actually know where they are. They can actually go ahead and put much more pressure. And then there, we actually see a, a different result. So the social pressure clearly uh, is working. But then there is going to be a, something like a cutoff point, right? So if you push people, people will respond, follow your, your direction. But if you're too arrogant in pushing, at some point, you, you will see the, uh, the action will be a backfire and they will retaliate. So uh, what we are saying is seeing is an important aspect of this interaction, but social interaction clearly is it, it, it playing a role there. Yeah, perfect. And uh, once again, as I mentioned before, you have a lot of questions, but I'm saving them for you. So, but let me just ask a last question by Vicky Tang who's asking, any selection in those whose contacts are called versus those uh, whose contacts are not called? Is there a minimum threshold on the loan size and the length in the late repayments? Oh yeah, uh, we actually don't see um, don't see a clear. There's clear selection because if you are late for uh, one or two days, you're not going to be called. Only after three days, and condition on on that you are being late for more than three days, you enter the pool, and that, there the selection is relatively well understood. Well, we hope. We actually analyze how the, the, the strategy is designed. We see clearly that the, also the, the collectors also state that they rank the borrowers according to the repayment propensity from the high to low. That's why we actually spend so much effort in finding out uh, those borrowers around the cutoff uh, point. Uh, by the way, the reason we, work so, we have to work so hard to find the cutoff point is because the lender does not provide us with the ranking because that's their business secret. They, they don't want us to know how they rank them, but they did tell us they rank by the repayment propensity. And we, we actually have independent evidence to support that as well. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'm saving the, all the other chat questions. I'm gonna send them to you via email so you can follow up to the um, people that ask you questions and uh, address them uh, via email over the weekend or next week. And, uh, but let me take a moment to thank so much uh, uh, Juan, Ansgar and Honjun for the fantastic presentation as well as their co-authors for writing excellent papers. Um, feel free to um, kind of follow us on Twitter at uh, GU Fin Policy. Uh, we are not having an event next week mainly because many people are on vacations in the last week of uh, July, but we will resume on August 7th. So you will receive information information regarding the upcoming events via email uh, next week. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. All right. Thank you.